today we inaugurate uh, Investor Insights, which is a new uh, service in our Insights series of video interviews. Uh, and in this series, we are, will be talking to top investors who will be sharing with us their best ideas and their insights into the financial markets and the economy. Um, Investor Insights is being sponsored by Global Payments Gaming Solutions, which is a division of Global Payments Inc. And we appreciate their support and what we believe will become an important service to investors. Uh, we are pleased and honored to inaugurate Investor Insights with the renowned investor, Jason Ader, uh, co-founder and CEO of Spring Owl Asset Management, uh, and a gentleman who is entering the SPAC field, which we will hear about momentarily. Uh, first of all, Jason, uh, thanks for your time today. Hi, Fra Hi Frank. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, you know, Jason, I, I have to tell this personal story. When I began what was our, originally our newsletter way back in the year in January of 2000, uh, I did this as a service for some fellow retail investors to maintain, a, to be kind of a community. And I thought I would start a newsletter and put a small price on it uh, just to establish some value. And in the very first week we were up, we got a call from your then uh, counterpart at Goldman Sachs, Steve Kent, interested in subscribing. And in the very second week, we got a call from your office at Bear Stearns interested in subscribing. So it took me two weeks to find out that there was actually a business opportunity here and it was for investment professionals, not um, retail investors. And I tell that story all the time, just to let you know. That's a great story. Yeah, I mean, 20 years uh, ago, it's hard to believe, but you know, your, your email, your, you know, your newsletter is a must read every day, no matter what. And I'm not, even if I'm on vacation and I'm not looking at emails, I'll read your email. So it's, it's really got <laughs> tremendous value. Good, I'm glad to hear it's addictive. <laughs> uh, Jason, let's begin by telling us about Spring Owl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we set Spring Owl up uh, eight years ago with the goal of being an independent sponsor. And an independent sponsor is like a buyout firm where we go out and find deals and uh, look to, um, improve uh, the performance you know, of, of the company that we've invested in. Very often, you know, we'll invest in companies whose businesses are great, but there's some disconnect with the uh, stock price relative to what the intrinsic value of the business would be. And it sort of started with IGT, you know, accidentally, like most good businesses, it started accidentally, if you recall, you know, took an investment in with, with Chuck Matthewson and a few others. Uh, Chuck was the founder um, of IGT's you know, modern day business and uh, you know, worked very hard to um, you know, get some board representation and, and a business um, that needed turning around in, in the right direction. And, and ultimately uh, um, in a pretty short period of time, G Tech and, and IGT came together. And that sort of started Spring Owl with this concept of taking you know, big investments in companies, not just in gaming, although we, you and I tend to talk more about the gaming industry opportunities, but, but big positions in companies that are great businesses, but for some reason, um, the stock prices don't reflect that underlying value. So, you know, from IGT, it's Las Vegas Sands, and as you know, you know, Las Vegas Sands was a was a director there for eight years, and it was just a great honor to be on uh, Sheldon Adelson's board and you know, watch the turnaround of success, turnaround and success of that company after the financial crisis. When I joined the board, the stock was four. Obviously, went to eighty. It paid out more in dividends than 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 my basis. Yeah, and so <clears throat> that was a, a spectacular turnaround and one that uh, you know I think you know is very well positioned. You know, when there's a recovery in travel tourism in Asia, um, we've invested. You know, Spring Owl you know, was an investor in B Win, which was a, is a really innovative, great um, sports betting platform. They had a, a poker business too, uh, and. And, and it was just a business that was worth a lot more than where the stock um, it was trading. And, and so again, with, with board seats and, and, and a little bit of a push, <laughs> we helped to get BWIN sold to GVC as just a great windfall for, for the GVC holders and the BWIN holders, because most of the BWIN holders uh, got shares in GVC. And um, you know, this has been repeated you know, sort of again and again, you know, we sort of did that with Amaya, uh, which, which was having some tough times uh, four and a half years ago when uh, uh, 
David Bazoff, who built a great company, but was uh, got in trouble with uh, some of the Canadian securities regulators, but it created this disconnect where this was an amazing business. Am Amaya had poker stars at over hundred million um, users and, and the stock price was down, um, I think 80% from the highs. Uh, so we made an investment and, and, and really worked very hard. And, and of course, Rafi Ashkenazi is the CEO of that company and turned Amaya into Stars Group, which became the largest, biggest publicly traded uh, online gaming company in the US. And, and Rafi is a partner of mine in uh, our new SPAC venture. So I'm real excited about that. And, you know, and, and with, and the last part of, you know, Spring Owl and gaming, you know, has been Playtech. It's been a great, you know, two year work in progress, uh, a very valuable, you know, amazing um, technology business, but there's been this disconnect in terms of where Playtech's stock price has been versus, um, you know, where it should be. And so I'm very happy to report it's a two year highs, but I think it's on its way to five year highs. And so I ho that hopefully gives you the essence of Spring Owl, at least in the context of gaming, is we make you know, big investments in companies we think are worth a lot more. And we often like to work with management and help um, you know, return you know, stock price to where, to where it should be trading. Sounds like you've not only uh, made some money, but you've had a lot of fun doing it. We had some fun, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, talk about that disconnect, Jason. Today, we have a market that is bullish, if not frothy. Mm -hmm. uh, What's your take on the market today, and especially in regard to gaming stocks? Um, look, the market today has uh, very obviously got pockets of, of, of speculation and, and, and bubbles, and, and you know you, <laughs> you see it everywhere. Um, I mean, you see it in, in Bitcoin, you see it in the SPAC market, um, you see it in the EV, the electronic vehicle market, um, and, and we're looking out <laughs> at maybe another $1.9 trillion stimulus on top of this froth. froth. And, and in addition to that, um, you know, everybody might be getting vaccinated soon with a lot of savings and start traveling and spending money. So, you know, the, the, the perfect scenario is, is set, um, you know, for continued growth, you know, in, in stock prices and, and, and asset inflation. But I would tread very carefully. You know, this this we, history would prove that this does not end well. Going back, um, not just to, and people like to point to 1999 or 1987 or 1929, but you could go back hundreds of years. Whether it be railroad industry or the tulip industry, you know, going going way back. I mean, there have been you know, it's always, history rhymes. Uh, history really rhymes, and so there's a lot of rhyming with peak uh, um, asset prices with what's happening now. And so, um, you know, we're trading very carefully. It's getting very hard um, to find inefficiencies in, in, in traditional assets uh, um, versus what we've seen over the last 10 years. The, um, and in gaming, one of the things we see today are a tremendous amount of excitement mm -hmm. over sports betting and iGaming proliferation in the United States. And we're seeing, so again, some pretty optimistic valuations. I, I can think of one company in which one sell side analyst is valuing their iGaming business at 60 times 2025's projected EBITDA. Uh, how do you see the opportunity or the risks in these two new areas? I mean, Frank, it's it sounds crazy, and and it and it is it, it is crazy. I, I it it reminds me of a story I heard this morning of a flying car. Remember, we always wanted flying cars as kids. Well, there's a flying car company that's coming public today, and and uh, Ken Mullis. Ken Mullis has been a pioneer with the uh, investment banker and for the gaming industry. You know, comes from Drexel and DLJ. So Ken Mullis is well known finance firm. So his SPAC um, is announced to deal with a flying car company today. Um, Big valuation um, off of you know 2026 revenues. So <laughs> whether it's 60 times you know some forward, I mean you you know there is a philosophy of of Graham and Dodds and there is a philosophy of Warren Buffett and I do come from a value investment background, but with so much excess liquidity in the system and so much stimulus and interest rates at virtually zero. The examples that we're talking about are the examples that we'll look back on and say, all the signs were there. All the signs were there in 2020 and 2021 that were just like 1999, that were just like 1987, that were just like 1929. Um, you know, you never know, really. I mean, you remember Alan Greenspan talked a lot about 
irrational exuberance and it took three years for there to be a market correction. So you don't know when the party stops, but this party will stop. And, and, and I suspect, unfortunately, it's not gonna be the institutions that get hurt the worst. It'll be the individuals. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of a story about, I think, was it the South Seas Corporation in the 17th century? And, you know, one of the questions is, who is the most intelligent man in history? And, and the answer that many people would say is Sir Isaac Newton. Yeah, and Sir and Isaac <laughs> Newton got caught up in this thing and eventually he got out, and, but he couldn't resist getting back in because it kept rising and rising. And finally, the bubble burst. And the moral of the story was, if the most intelligent man in history cannot resist a bubble, what makes you think you can? That's right. Yeah, the South Sea bubble is a classic, you know, historical case study in, in, in manias. And, and Isaac Newton, obviously brilliant and, and got caught up in it. Everybody was caught up in it. And uh, there was a, a GameStop mania um, very, very recently. Um, I mean, I read a statistic that like four out of every 10 households owned a share in GameStop. Is that an unbelievable number? I think that number was is actually true. Um, four out of 10 households owned GameStop. Um, so, so we will look back at that and it's become, you know, a bit of a pop culture at the moment, but um, it's definitely not healthy from an investment perspective. People are making money, um, people are losing money, um, but, but um, you know, I, I think we all have to be tread, treading very carefully. Um, you know, it can unwind very quickly. And into this environment, you have entered with a SPAC. Acquisition, 26 acquisition. Tell us about 26 acquisition, whose ticker symbol, appropriately enough, is A D E R U. That's right. That's right. Good, good, good ticker symbol. Um, so 26 uh, Capital is my third SPAC, actually. I have actually done two before uh, in, in a different time when SPACs weren't nearly as popular, and, and, and one of them you know, went and merged with a bunch of uh, Asian-based hospitality businesses, and the other one, the second SPAC, uh, merged with a, a bank in Las Vegas, uh, which became the best capitalized community bank in Las Vegas and uh, during the worst of the financial crisis and ultimately was sold uh, to Western Alliance Bank Corp. So this is SPAC number three. And after, after two, I thought I was done. And, and what happened, Frank, is very interesting, was over the summer, um, I started to get phone calls from very interesting, big, well-known private companies who said, Jason, you know, we, uh, we got a call from the former CEO of, or the, C the guy who used to be the CEO of, and he raised this thing called the SPAC and proposed a deal for us. And the deal seems to be a pretty good deal, but this guy wants to get involved in running the business or he wants to go on our board and he wants to tell us what to do. We're sort of interested in this. Can we talk with you about your SPAC? Frank, I didn't have a SPAC. And this, this happened once in August, once in um, September, twice in October, <laughs> so, I, so I called up my investment bankers and said, like, we're getting some great calls and, and they all seem to want to go public via SPAC, but they're concerned about the other sponsors who have led big businesses, who are who were former CEOs of gaming companies who want to involve themselves in the business. They want to keep running the businesses the way they have been. They just want access to the public markets and they want, you know, a strategic investment partner, not a strategic operating partner. And there's a big, there's a big difference between the two. So um, you know, we decided, you know, on that basis, you know, that, that there may be, you know, a unique place in a very crowded market for investment expertise to partner up with operational expertise, because I'm not looking to tell any successful private company how to do things better. But where I have been helpful is, you know, in, in you know, board leadership, governance, management alignment. Um, you know, my, I, I wrote a book uh, this, this during the pandemic that came out in March, it's called Deviate to Win. And it really talks about the importance, not just of board governance and having a board that holds management accountable for stock price performance, but aligning management and, and making sure that your management teams wake up every day and say, today's a good day if our stock price goes up. Not, not today's a good day if I get a big paycheck. Today's a good day if my stock price goes up. And, and so um, that, those two disciplines that are really at the, at the forefront of my new book are at the essence of our, of our SPAC and, and what we hope to be able to bring 
um, because I'm not looking to, I have a great day job. So I'm not looking to run, um, you know, somebody else's business. Um, but, but I do have a lot of success in, 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 in helping businesses that are worth less than where they should be and getting them back to premium valuation. So certainly was the case with Stars Group and Sands and IGT and BWIN and now Playtech back at a two-year high. So tell us a little bit about your target company and then how, how's the hunting going so far? Yeah, the, the target company, everybody's sort of expecting us to do, you know, something in gaming. You know, gaming is a very fertile, you know, interesting area right now, but it's it's crowded and, and, and competitive and we may not do something in gaming. We're, we're certainly looking. Um, we like, you know, the, the sector. We like the you know, social gaming sector. Um, there's, um, you know, lots of parts of the ecosystem around online gaming. Um, that still have a significant amount of growth that I would, I would you know, throw out uh, payment processing is an example of that. And non, you know, non real money more, you know, when I say social gaming, I mean, businesses that, that look like some of the pop culture um, video games that, you know, our kids are all playing like, like Among Us and Fortnite businesses like that, um, that are more traditional video gaming, but have the potential to cross into real money gaming. And, and so um, we're looking at all at, at all those areas um, with a SPAC, um, and, and we'll see. We have, we have, as you know, we have uh, two years uh, to bring forth uh, a deal, and um, you know, this is this is uh, an exciting time to be looking at opportunities. There's a little bit of a debate over SPACs themselves, whether they uh, allow for the same sort of scrutiny as the tr tr conventional IPO process or whether in fact they're actually superior because they kind of democratize that IPO process and they uh, are more free to describe the, their uh, future potential. Yeah. What do you see as the advantages and the disadvantages of the SPAC? So I, I took a 10 year break from the SPAC market because in the 2009, 2010 period, it, it was not my belief that the SPAC was a superior product. Over that 10 year period, because I got to learn and, and know them very well, having sponsored two SPACs over 10 years ago. And it just had a lot of structural flaws to it that evolved and improved. So the 2021 SPAC today has two significant advantages that are noteworthy, but they're not permanent. And so it's something that SPAC sponsors need to be careful of, one of which is speed to market. You can bring a company to market faster via SPAC than the traditional IPO. So that's a good thing. Number two is how you articulate the future prospects of the business. And, and in a SPAC that's called um, an SEC form four, it allows you to tell everything you wanna talk about with respect to the business and the financial projections and um, your, 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 your growth and revenues and EBITDA um, and, and KPI objectives going out to 2026 if, if, um, if, if you'd like to. In the traditional IPO format, you, you don't file an S4 because a SPAC is a merger. So a merger document is an S4. You file something called an S1. And an S1 is very um, restrictive um, uh, you know, on, on what you can say. You can't really give projections. You, you know, you're limited in terms of how you can talk about the business. And so you don't have the ability. So, so if you go the traditional IPO route, it's slower and you don't necessarily have as much flexibility to share with investors who want to invest in your company, your true vision of where you think the business can be and how it can get there. So that's, and, 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 and so to me that, that's, pretty, that's pretty compelling and some very big and important companies uh, are going um, public via the SPAC route. But what's the risk, right? I mean, we thought about this a lot when we, we did a SPAC. I mean, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ um, you know, could very, and, and the SEC could just say, look, <laughs> we're, gonna we're gonna change the S1 to make it look like the S4. And, and then what's, what's the advantage of a SPAC? And, and, and I would go as far as saying the London Stock Exchange is looking at what's happening here. And the London Stock Exchange has is, is, is got basically no activity and the IPO activity because of SPACs in the US is extraordinary. So London Stock Exchange is thinking of changing their listing documents to look like an S4 so that you can list on the London Stock Exchange and it could be almost like a SPAC to try to attract business over there. So I think SPAC sponsors have to be very realistic that this, this is a structural loophole that's great for investors and great for companies, but it may not last forever. And it probably won't. Uh, Jason, finally, this is Investor Insights. Um, what are one or two of the uh, best ideas you have in gaming right now? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I'm one of the biggest shareholders of Playtech. I think it's incredibly well positioned, you know, as, as a company now, we've got, you know, a, a great board, you know, that's in place now, new, all, mostly all new directors who are really focused on the shareholders. Um, the management team a little over a year ago called a special meeting with another shareholder, put a compensation plan in place uh, for, for more wiser and everybody there that they, they wake up every day now they can make a lot of money if the stock goes back to the five-year highs. So, so we're at the two, but we're, we're going to the five. But if we can get to the five-year highs, they can really make a lot of money. And so that, I love the alignment that's in place. They still have great um, technology. You know, there's a lot of US companies now who are getting product, product demos from all the providers of content and platforms. And everybody's telling me, wow, you know, we, we knew about Playtech, but we didn't realize how good their gaming content is and their live table game content and all the other you know, various tools um, you know, that they offer to operators. Uh, and so Playtech has gone through hard times. It's, you know, I think we've helped and we've worked you know, well with management to sort of get them to the other side of that. They're, they're, they had a, every possible challenge in 2020 and they still had a, a very good year. Um, and you know, with, with sports being shut down and, and there's the studios for, for, for live table games being shut down. Um, so I think I think Playtech's on a on a great path, and and of course the gaming industry is consolidating rapidly. And there's there's not very many companies in the UK that have real EBITDA that are trading at low multiples left. Right? I mean, Ladbrokes was acquired. Um, you know, William Hill was acquired. We'll see what happens with GVC and and, and MGM. But there's there's Playtech and there's 888, and and there's a lot of value to being sort of the last few independents in a, in a consolidating industry. So I'm excited about what Playtech is doing. And I would encourage anybody who's in the gaming industry to get a product you know, de demo, see, see how advanced you know, their, their products are and how they could help. Um, you know, I'd, I would also you know, point out um, Las Vegas Sands down here. You know, it's, it's, it's um, really had a pullback because of Asia and Macau and just no Chinese New Year now two years in a row and, and, and the Fortunate, you know, death of uh, founder Sheldon Adelson. But this is a, a great. I mean, Las Vegas is a great business. There's not a lot of debt. I mean, and when things get back to normal, and you and everyone else get, you know, injected and start traveling, and and the world, you know, sort of finds its way back to high, highly desirable places like Macau and Singapore, Las Vegas Sands is going to be making five billion dollars in EBITDA again. Not this year, but in the future. And the stock prices will start to reflect that. And when you look at the entire market right now. Las Vegas Sands is one of the few companies that's really pretty far off the highs. And there are a lot of tailwinds that would, I think, you know, lead me to believe and, and anyone to believe that, you know, travel and tourism, you know, will recover again, um, and, you know, as everybody gets vaccinated. And certainly Macau and Singapore are going to be highly desirable. We, you know, Las Vegas is such a small part of their business. I think Las Vegas will probably be the slowest to recover. But it's good value here, and, and they're great, and they're great assets. And so, yeah, you know, I would leave you with uh, my two best ideas being, you know, Playtech uh, and Las Vegas Sands at current prices. Okay, great. In terms of Las Vegas Sands, you don't consider there to be political risk with the Chinese government. And look, it's a great question. You know, obviously, Wilford, you know, is very well connected, you know, running, you know, Sands China, and you know, there's a lot of Chinese employees uh, in, in, in the company. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, a Chinese, you know, essentially uh, business. And so while the ownership is, is U.S. ownership, um, there, there is, you know, risk. Um, I, there may, I've, I've kind of always thought that in part of the relicensing process that there would be a requirement to have more local ownership sort of like when you know has uh, you know local local owner in uh, in galaxy so do one of the do one of the um, you know owners in uh, uh, the the Asian companies you know get the opportunity to buy into sans China as part of the licensing that may be but that shouldn't hurt it's not going to be dilutive it just means that you know there be more local ownership but but you know I come back to like is there a disconnect between what the stock price is saying versus the core business. And I think we would both agree if um, SANS Macau assets were allowed to perform at peak potential because everybody's been vaccinated and they've made a lot of upgrades and they have you know, new, new additions, new, new CapEx projects um, you know, on Kotai that are just spectacular. When people start going back and traveling again, 
I mean, you know, there's there's just you know, I mean, five five billion in EBITDA potential from this company, which is incredibly exciting. So the political risk, I think, is real, but can be mitigated. And you know, it, it the, the the Chinese government, I does I do think, recognizes you know the leadership of Sands China and the employee base of the company is um, is Chinese, and so it would be unwise and punitive, you know, to to, to do something negative to that group. Uh, Jason, this has been a really great, far-reaching discussion in a short period of time. Any anything else you'd like to add? Nope, always great to catch up with you. Happy to do it. Maybe, maybe we'll maybe when we announce something for uh, Twenty Six Capital, uh, we look forward to coming back on and, and talking about our, our transaction with you. We will be glad to do it. Uh, thank you for your insights. Great. Take care, Frank.